I want to say a special thanks to our wonderful group of volunteers. For all these programs, the, the, the work of the volunteers that not only help with these programs, but help our school year round are really just extraordinary. And I, they're fine people. And please join me in thanking them for a job. You know, it's always great when you get to brag on, on your graduates. Uh, and it's always great when you see them come back uh, after leaving the school and, and launching successful both personal and professional lives. And today we're honored to bring back a graduate from the third class. Hunter Riley is director of programs at the Pat Tillman Foundation, where he directs scholar selection and engagement. He joined the Tillman Foundation in 2009 after completing his work uh, with the Clinton School and he did his capstone, our final individual service project with the Pat Tillman Foundation that ultimately led um, to his employment. It is a real pleasure to have him back. It is also a real pleasure to have Marie back because about five years ago, she came to the school in one of her first public appearances and we were honored to have her. And now with her new book, we're honored to have her back uh, to present her and to moderate the program, please welcome Clinton School alumnus, Hunter Riley. As Skip said, five years ago, I was sitting in these uh, seats uh, with an audience of new class members. Actually, the first public program that I was able to attend as a Clinton School student was that of uh, Marie Tillman and her brother-in-law, Alex Garwood. And I am elated to five years from that date. And Nikolai gave me the exact date, August 22nd. So it's been a little over five years. But five years later, four years of those with the foundation, I'm elated to welcome Marie back to the Clinton School and to Arkansas, my home state. Uh, before I welcome Marie up on stage, I want to tell you all a little bit about uh, the Pat Tillman Foundation. In the four years since uh, Marie started our Tillman Military Scholars Program, we have funded $3.2 million to 230 Tillman Military Scholars at 74 institutions in 32 states. 19 of those who are here in Arkansas, none of which could join us. They're all either at Arkansas State, at the University of Arkansas, or at their jobs uh, around the U.S. in Indianapolis and Washington, D.C. So we have uh, not only been able to uh, support uh, military veterans and spouses in the state of Arkansas but nationwide and it's been a real joy to be a part of this growth of this foundation and uh, the mission that we have to invest in military veterans and spouses through educational scholarships. Uh, joining Marie here today are uh, some of our newest Razorback fans in the back uh, her husband Joe Shinton and holding a onesie Razorback fan, Max and I want to welcome them and give them a round of applause. The work of the foundation is just one part of Marie's story, and hopefully today we'll be able to talk a little more about her journey since the death of Pat Tillman, really actually not even uh, since then, but before then upon Pat's decision to, to join the Army Rangers and and how September 11th and beyond has really impacted her life and her journey through both a professional career with the foundation and other jobs and now with a, a new family and uh, a beautiful baby boy. So it is my honor uh, to again welcome to the stage my friend and boss Marie Tillman. So Marie and I practiced this conversation in the car just a little bit. Um, but it goes back to the beginning. Uh, many of you, if you've read the book, you open it up. The first chapter talks about uh, the day that Pat was killed, April 22nd, 2004. And my first question uh, for you, Marie, is really uh, you dive right in. What were your emotions and thoughts at that moment uh, at work that day? Um. You know, I do kind of just get right into it in the beginning of the book, and I think that um, the reason for doing that is hopefully to bring everyone into that place where I was at that point in time. And, um, 
You know, it's one of those moments in life, and I think that probably everybody has felt something similar where just everything sort of stops. And, um, you know, it was, it was a life-changing moment and something that even though I was somewhat so stunned and shocked, um, I was aware of the fact that nothing would be the same after that day. I think you, you talk about it a little bit in the book, and I, I know we've, we've talked about this. That day, so many thoughts, so many emotions ran through your body, and then at the end of the day, you just, you just went home and went to sleep. Yeah, well, kind of. Kind of. <laughs> kind of. I mean, it was, um, it was a very busy day. I mean, I was told that Pat had been killed, and then, um, you know, th there was a lot of motion in order to get the news to all of the proper people. And I think that because he was, you know, a very high profile enlisted soldier at the time, you know, the, the word had gotten out. And um, so my job that day was really to make sure that all of the people that needed to know were informed before it hit the news, which I was told was coming soon. Um, so it was sort of all of this commotion. And then at the end of the day, there was silence. You know, my, my parents had come up from um, California to be with me and my sister, but the house was very full, and then everyone kind of settled in their rooms, and I was, I was all alone. And that was really the first moment that I had the entire day to really think about what had happened and realize that, you know, this was real. And is that when you found the letter? Is that when you opened the letter? That's when I opened the letter. Um, the letter was something that Pat had written actually when his first deployment to Iraq. And he had come home safely and had put it on our bedroom dresser and said, you know, this is for you in case in the future I don't come home. So it was one of those things that just sort of sat there, but we both knew what it was and what it meant, and we never talked about it. So. Um, you know, I knew it was there, but it was sort of at the end of that first day when I was alone in my room that I remembered and pulled it out to read what he had left. And, and for those of you, I won't spoil the book. If you, you read further, uh, you find out what's said in that letter, and it's really, really a beautiful uh, a bequest of, from Pat to Marie. And moving on from there, you spent, uh, obviously, the next couple weeks and months getting your stuff together, and you moved to New York. Um, started a job with ESPN. I did. I spent um, about a year and a half in Washington. We were stationed Fort Lewis outside of Seattle, and I and I stayed there for a while. Um, Pat's brother Kevin had enlisted with him as well, and he was determined to finish his commitment to the military. And he had a year and a half left on his his enlistment, and so we stayed there. But and I loved it. I loved it up there, and I loved sort of just really being able to be close to where we had been together and his stuff and, and all of that. Um, but in time, I felt like I needed to, to get away sort of from all of that. And so I did. I moved to New York, which at the time, I knew nobody. Mm -hmm. And it was sort of an escape. Definitely an escape, and I think, as you said before, a place to be anonymous yeah. and a place to get lost. But after a few years in New York, one of my favorite parts of Marie's journey and uh, definitely one that I try to emulate is that of your international travels. You quit your job at ESPN and moved to Buenos Aires for just a, a quick jaunt in South America. What, yeah. was, what was that decision? You know, I think that if I, when I look back on some of the decisions that I made during that time, um, I really was just kind of going with my gut and I would just sort of decide to move, get up and move places. And certainly the move to New York was like that. And then also um, with the trip to Argentina, I was um, at that point in time, I think maybe it was about four years or so after Pat was killed. And um, I was really getting very restless. And, you know, after he died, it was one of those things where there were, in many ways, life became very clear to me. You know, here was this tragic thing that happened in my life, and I knew that life was short, and that, you know, I wanted to find something meaningful that I could direct my focus to. And um, 
you know, that was very sort of loomed very large in the beginning and with the investigations and a lot of stuff and just the grief, really. I really sort of was drowning in a lot of that for years. And about four years, you know, when I was in New York and starting um, to get itchy again and thinking, okay, what, what am I doing? What am I doing with my life? You know, this is, this is not what it's all about. I had a job at ESPN that I loved, but it was um, not something that felt very meaningful or, or you know, impactful. And um, so I quit my job and said, I, I'll just travel, right? I will just go on this journey to Argentina and see some different part of the world and I'll figure it out while I'm gone. Um, and it turned out to be actually a really, a really great trip. I mean, I think on a lot of levels, it was something that, um, it was the first time I had traveled internationally by myself. Um, and it made me realize that I didn't need to wait for a friend to be available or, you know, even, even though Pat was gone, I could, still, I could still live my life. I could still do things like travel and go on adventures. And, um, and I really did spend a couple of weeks kind of wandering around thinking, you know, what am I going to do with my life and what's this all about? And, you know, really sort of these deep, deep thoughts. Mm -hmm. um, and I realized actually at that time that, you know, one of the times that I felt happiest in my life was when Pat joined the Army. And, you know, this notion of us being joined together, focused on something that's larger than ourselves, this, you know, being in service to something that wasn't necessarily for us specifically, um, was really a happy time in my life. And I knew that that's where I wanted to get back to. And so that trip, you know, it was, it was for fun and it was, you know, to see something new. But um, in the end, it really did refocus me to the work of the foundation that we do now and really getting back to what I call kind of that, that journey of service that we started together. Yeah, so to get the timeline straight, you were here five years ago. That trip was yeah. a year after that about. It was, um, yeah, probably. Yeah. So yeah. one of the questions I have and and the, the unique transition I've been able to see in Marie in the past five years, getting to meet her you know, very quietly back in the library and speak more to your brother-in-law, Alex, our um, inaugural executive director, and then meeting you in New Orleans at uh, CGIU as a student, and that's really where our relationship began. And then as Kip said, I moved out to Arizona uh, over four years ago, or right about four years ago, um, your transition from your time here at the Clinton School to a year after that, after your Buenos Aires trip, and then the, the two years after as you started to step up into more public appearances, mm -hmm. and now and into an author who's been on all the national broadcast, all the NPR syndicates, what's changed? How is, it's five years, yeah. and you're up here, and I don't think you look nervous at all. Thank you. Um, a, a lot has changed. I mean, but I think that really for me, it was coming to terms with the fact that I had, I had a choice. You know, I could take this experience and all of these things that happened in my life and decide to kind of embrace it and figure out a way to find something positive to do with it. Or I could continue to be uncomfortable by it and um, sort of hide. And it was difficult because it was such a public, you know, this very private thing that played out publicly. And um, in the beginning, I just wasn't ready to take on that role. I wasn't ready and I hadn't had enough time to process it myself and figure out what that experience meant to me. And I think that as soon as I was able to do that, it became much easier to go out and talk about it and, you know, be more comfortable. Yeah, well, you took another trip that... Uh, it's a theme. Yeah, yeah it's a theme. <laughs> it, you uh, went to Laos for several weeks. Yeah, to, a I month. feel like, yeah, yeah a month to I meditate. Was it, was, <laughs> it was not a meditation trip, okay. but yes. Well, you went to, to take another break and to, yeah. I guess, another soul-searching... A trip and your brother joined you afterwards so you mm -hmm. had a, a travel companion can you tell us about that trip and how I, mean, I feel that the timing of that really led you into telling this story in the book that we're gonna be able to read after this event 
The, um, and I think that the, the trip to Argentina really started me back. My travel bug was back. And so I did a couple years later, I took a trip to Southeast Asia. And um, the thing that was great about that trip, I did a couple of weeks of volunteer work in Laos um, teaching English. And then I traveled all through Vietnam and Cambodia. And um, you, my brother joined me for part of the trip. And it was at that point, too, where I was really thinking about you know, some of the things that had happened in my life and the work that we do with the foundation and the people that I've met along the way and all of the stories that I had heard of other people's loss or difficulty and um, just was starting to realize that my story might be something that could help other people. And my brother was very encouraging of, you know, yeah, I think you should definitely you know, put it down on paper and, and give it a go. Well, I love the dedication in this book and this is one question I didn't pass by you, but in looking through it just now, you dedicate it to Christine and Paul yeah. for, for them you know, being there to let you know where you're from and what you can become, I think is how you put yeah. it, which is obviously they're very special to you. And as you mentioned, Paul and the trip really prodded you along. Yeah. I mean, I think that you know, some of my closest relationships are with my brother and sister. And I mean, you know, you come from a big family and you're close with your siblings. And it is. It's, they are the people that have been with you your entire life and um, really were my biggest support and cheerleaders and, um, you know, but never, but when I'm with them, I always remember sort of where I came from. It, it, obviously very special relationships and, and very, uh, a very fun brother if he flew over yeah. to Southeast Asia to travel with you. Uh, I'm lucky to have similar siblings. In, in the book, you also talk about a trip you took uh, to Afghanistan. You mm -hmm. had the opportunity with the USO to go to the Pat Tillman USO. And for those of you who are unaware of the Pat Tillman USO, it is the closest thing to home in Afghanistan. It's in Bagram, at Bagram Airfield. And so any of you who have been in the military or any of you who know anyone at Little Rock Air Force Base, they probably have passed through uh, this USO if they've been in and out of Operation Enduring Freedom. But you, you took a trip there. Tell us about that trip, and then I'll have a follow-up question on your way home. Um, and I had been wanting to get to Afghanistan and had sort of gone through various you know, channels to try and get there, and nothing seemed to be working out. And, um, and I got a call from the USO asking if I wanted to go on an entertainment tour to go see the center. And, um, take a trip, which I jumped on. You did know, you sing and dance while you were I did there? not sing and dance, <laughs> but um, we went with Gary Sinise mm -hmm. and the Lieutenant Dam Band, and you know, it was it was great experience. And to be able to see, you know, the center, like you said, where um, I mean, tens of thousands of soldiers have gone through, and really get a, a taste of home right there in the middle of Afghanistan, um, was really something for me that was such a great experience and you know at that time too I was much more involved with the foundation and the work we do with veterans and to be able to really see firsthand part of their experience overseas was something that was incredibly valuable. So, and on your way home is you know part of your story I didn't know actually hmm. and on staff we knew that you had gone to Afghanistan, visit the USO, uh, spent a few days there you came back uh, with uh, a service member who had been killed in action. Mm -hmm. Tell us about the request for that and kind of how it really brought your experience there full circle to yeah. Pat's death. Well, and it is, um, you know, you're, you're on base there and it's relatively safe. You know, you're very protected from Inside what's going, yeah, yeah, exactly, from what's going on outside. Um, and we were getting ready to leave, to go back to Germany and then back to the United States. And um, there was a special forces soldier that was killed. And so we were going to be taking him back with us. So they came to me and said, you know, this is, is what's going on. And it really, um, it brings it all, it all full circle. Um, I mean, you, the realities of war, which I knew very well, but also to accompany this young man home, you know, and I remember sitting there thinking as the casket was going on the plane before we got on, you know, this is, this is how Pat came home. And so it just, it was, um, it was very surreal for me to be there and experience that as 
sort of a bystander and the thought of, you know, his family at home and they were waiting, you know, it's like I remembered being at home waiting for his body to arrive and it just really made me, it, it really made me think about, you know, why I had written the book and, you know, his wife, I remember the, um, the, the guy that was in charge came and said, you know, he was married, no children. You know, they told us a little bit about the soldier before they did the ceremony for him. And I thought, that was me back home, married, you know, that, that somebody had said the same thing. And so it just, it really sort of reinforced this feeling of, you know, there are other people out there that are going through this and maybe my experience can be helpful to this young girl who's back home. So you really play two roles in one, obviously, uh, being an inspiration and you know, carrying these stories that you hear and in your personal life writing this book, but you also serve as the president and co-founder of the Pat Tillman Foundation. And as I mentioned, our, our mission is to invest in veterans and military spouses uh, through educational scholarships. Can you tell us more about the, the work of the foundation and really how you've been able to translate a lot of what's been your personal journey into mm -hmm. a, a, this professional uh, career. And the foundation really has been sort of a byproduct of all that has happened that has been such a pleasant surprise for me. I mean, when Pat was killed and we started the organization, I had no idea what we were doing. We didn't really know exactly what we were going to focus on and um, really hit our stride by focusing the mission on veterans and education. And um, I mean, you know, you work with the, the men and women that we support every day. And it's just incredible to me that, you know, Pat's life and his legacy can live on through these people that continue to, you know. Why, why education? I think for those of you who are familiar with the veteran space, there are a lot of organizations focused on mental health, which is a, a big, big focus right mm -hmm. now, including suicide. A lot of organizations focus on employment. Why education? It, that's a good question. I mean, there, there are so many issues around in the veteran space. And um, one thing that I learned pretty early on when we started the organization is that we couldn't be everything to everybody, right? We really needed to, in order to um, have a big impact, with whatever it is that we were gonna do, we had to really narrow our focus. And for me, education is something that empowers people. I just felt like that was the best way that we could help these young men and women was to help them get educated so that they can then move forward and do all the wonderful things that they're doing out there. Well, tell us a few stories then. Yeah, I mean, um, we'll talk a little bit about some, some Arkansas natives here. Um, and I think that both of them actually are a good example of the, the different types of people that we have in our program, because it's a, it's a diverse group, as you know. Um, and I think that um, we have Thomas Bishop, mm -hmm. who's at the University of Arkansas. And you know, he, to me, is really an example of somebody who is so focused and determined to get his education. You know, he was an ROTC student and in the middle of getting his master's degree when he was deployed to Afghanistan and served for years, always knowing, I'm sure in the back of his head, that he wanted to come home and to continue his education, applied to our program yeah. while he was overseas. He's and one of the unique applicants we get. You have people call in from Afghanistan asking about the scholarship because they know that in the fall semester the when they get back, yeah. they're gonna get there and they need to get the deadline in. It's, and it's so just an incredible individual, right, who has served his country and wants to come home and continue to serve and now works in D.C., you know, mm -hmm. on, on media policy. Yeah. And, um, you know, I just, I feel like there's so many stories like that. And then to complement that, we have the spouses. Mm -hmm. And, you know, really, it's, it's that experience that I can most relate to. Um, you know, and we have um, a student here at she's at Arkansas. Yeah, Br Brandy Humphrey at, at Arkansas, Arkansas State. State, and her ASU, which is not Arizona State. I Everyone know, I always that get confused. that confused. Um, 
But she, you know, her husband served for 14 years, I think it was, mm -hmm. and that experience changed her. You know, the same way that I feel like the experience that I had with Pat in the service changed my outlook about, you know, service and veterans and the military and really is part of the reason why I do the work that I do today, similar to her story. You know, her focus is on helping, helping veterans on campus. Mm -hmm. So I think we have just, you know, such an eclectic group of really amazing people that we get to see, you know, move forward and just the great things that they're able to, to do. Tell us, so the foundation obviously provides scholarships for their education, it's investing mm -hmm. in their education, but beyond that, what are you able to do with these amazing leaders? You know, I think, and, and now that we're four years into the program, what we're seeing really is the network mm -hmm. and this community that is forming with these scholars as they graduate and move on into jobs and as they're spread across the country and the power of that. Um, you know, and it's really about helping them to transition from military life onto campus and, you know, from student life into the working world. Yeah. Now it's, it's incredible to see, again, the, the 230 individuals that we're able to work with take their individual skills and apply them. I know. What's your, what's your favorite story? Well, I know you have one. I have a ton of favorite <laughs> stories, but one I'll tell because it's very recent. Uh, Marie had a spread in People magazine about nine months ago, and Lindsay Anderson, who was in the photo shoot with you, she's from Iowa, went to NYU for museum studies, and she was in our first class, and just getting some of that creative field yeah. into our diversity of studies from our scholars. She has now gone on to work at a museum called the Rubin Museum in New York City in Chelsea and has helped with their education programs. And through that article, actually, yeah. got called to uh, be a educator in residence in Aspen hmm. at the Aspen Center for Arts, and just from the network yeah. and from people being aware. So, But the thing that I think is interesting about her story, too, though, is really what sparked that mm -hmm. was the experience that she had in exactly. Iraq. Um, you know, seeing some of the ruins and the things that were destroyed, and She ultimately. brought them back to the, uh, to the University of Iowa Museum there. Yeah. I so, I mean, the, you know, all of these people that are using mm -hmm. that experience and then bringing it forward, I yeah. think is... I could tell all their stories, but I won't. Okay. Um, but yes, Lindsay's one of the earliest ones that I think is, shows a very good example of what you've talked about mm -hmm. in connecting that experience in the military to what they're doing next. Um, to kind of bring it to a, a current events level and to uh, see if Skip knows the answer to this, this is current events class. Up to two weeks ago, how many deaths, KI, have there been in Operation Enduring Freedom? Does anyone know the answer? to that question, and not Nikolai. Not, not Iraq and Afghanistan together, just OEF. And no one's raising their hand. There's been 2,000, 2,000, including yeah. Pat Tillman. Yeah. Um, no one knows that. Uh, maybe someone did, they're just too shy to answer the question. Tell us about working in a space where only 1% of the population is really a part of the equation. I think that that is, you know, one of the things that we strive to do is bring awareness to the experience of, of veterans. And um, I remember that feeling of isolation when Pat joined, was deployed, and then was killed. It is such a small percentage of our country that serves or knows somebody who serves or has any experience with, you know, what's going on. And here, you know, here it is, 11 years later, 2,000 deaths, and people don't really know that. And I think that that is, that's the difficulty, you know, and, and that's what we hear also from our scholars. They've been deployed overseas, they have had, you know, incredible life-changing experiences, and they come back on campus, and nobody has any idea what's gone on, right? So it's, it's a challenge. I think that um, there are things in the media, people are trying to bring awareness to the issues, um, certainly, but we have a long way to go. So, uh, uh, last question for me, and then we want to open it up to the audience and then whisk Marie away to her flight. What's something from the past eight and a half years? It's almost eight and a half years. We host an event, uh, Pat's Run, every April, right around uh, the anniversary of Pat's death, so it's easy to keep count. Yeah. Um, eight and a half years, you have 
obviously grown as a person, um, as a family member, as a mother, and then as a professional, which is what I get to see uh, day to day. Out of all your experiences, all of your travels, all the stories you've heard, what's something you would pass on to, I mean, not even those who've had similar experiences as you, but to anyone who is listening here today? Gosh, that's a tough question. Um, you know, I think that for me, one of the biggest things that I realized um, along the way is that I had a choice, right? I mean, you can't, you can't change the things that happen to you in your life and you can't control them, you know, 99% of the time, but you can decide how you're gonna take those experiences and what you're gonna do with them. And that really is where the power is, right? Because you, you do have control of your attitude every day and what you do with the things that happen to you. And I, I have to say, I admire Marie because her choice has always been a positive one. Of all the things that we see, not only in the veteran space, but on the news to take such a tragedy and make such a positive impact through the foundation and through your own personal work, it's, it's very awesome just to be by your side when you do that. Thank so we want to open it up, uh, well, I guess a clap, clap for Marie. Oh. <laughs> clap for Hunter. <laughs> Thank you. I want to open up for questions, and I think we have one right here in the back. Um, could you discuss the issue of whether the government was candid with you and the American people about the circumstances of Pat Tillman's death? Yeah, they, they certainly were not honest with us. Um, you know, and that, and that was something that for many, many years occupied my life and made it really difficult to, to be positive and to move forward and to try and take the good and, and bring that along. Um, so it was difficult for many years. Up front and then we'll go to the back there. Have, uh, has Arizona State University and the Phoenix, or Arizona Cardinals, have, have they supported the foundation? They have, actually. We, um, Arizona State University this year um, is one of our schools that we chose as a partner school. We have 14 across the country that we partner with um, because of the veteran resources that they have on campus. And so we were really happy. They just built actually a new center on campus that's amazing. And it's, a, it's great to have that support locally in Tempe. And the Cardinals have, have also been very supportive of us. We, we host Pat's Run on campus at Arizona State. Yeah. So. They're our biggest sponsor for that event, and I mean, our not being from Arizona, family. I'm the only non-Arizonan in the office, and ASU is everywhere. We have one uh, University of Arizona grad, and that's it, but everyone else within that community really wraps their arms around yeah. the Pat Tillman Foundation. Definitely. A question in the back. Congratulations on a great baby. Thank and, you. Uh, and congratulations for this and, and appreciation for this foundation. Um, myself and my buddy over here, we were both veterans of the Iraq War. I lost friends in both Iraq and Afghanistan. Two, your conversation brought two quick questions in mind. Number one, did Pat ever talk about the draft or how he felt about a draft being a member of the all volunteer service. And the second thing, what was your perception of the military and veterans before Pat and then after? Um, you know, the draft was not something that we had ever talked about, so I can't really speak to that. But um, certainly I am guilty of not having much experience with veterans or the military prior to Pat enlisting. And um, so I can empathize with sort of this disconnect and, and you know, if, if it's not part of your experience, it's not part of your experience, right? Um, but I do think that, you know, that's part of what we try to do as well, is to change the perception and to let people know about these great men and women that have served and that are coming home and that are continuing to move on into areas 
you know, positions of leadership around our country, um, because I think that there is a little bit of a misconception. Question right here. Uh, I'm amazed at what you've said to us today. Uh, I don't know if you know the answer to this question, but from the first war and the second war and the Korean War and the Vietnam War, we had something called a GI Bill that when the veterans came home, they could take that money and further their education. Uh, I'm retired military myself, but I don't know how that's progressing now with all the budget cuts, what's available to returning veterans, plus the budget cuts are going to put a lot of people unemployed mm -hmm. after they finish their commitment. Do you know anything about the GI Bill? Yeah, definitely. Um, I mean, the GI Bill, there, there are benefits that are given to veterans um, for education through the GI Bill. And, you know, I think that part of what we do is work in conjunction with that. Um, it's it's sort of a great baseline resource for them. Um, unfortunately, it doesn't cover everything. And we do have a lot of students that are in graduate school and programs where there's still a significant need. Um, and that's really where we try to step in and, and fill those gaps. Yeah, the, the post 9-11 GI Bill was uh, enacted three years ago and was part of the, the first wave of these yeah. veterans coming back from Iraq and Afghanistan. And they've revised it since. and. It provides 17,500 across the board to anyone attending any school, in state, out of state, private, public. You have a baseline and then we've, again, it's more of a partnership with the VA and, and the fact that we're able to provide $10,000 upwards from that. No. And in a lot of cases too, um, most of our students are non-traditional students. They have spouses and children and, you know, a lot of things in their lives that sometimes can stand in the way of getting an education. So um, we're able to help with things like childcare and, you know, a variety of... The scholarship itself is really a, a force multiplier. It, it, or it takes the distraction of having to worry about insurance or high tuition costs and allows these scholars to, as Marie said, apply their uh, intuition to serve and their, I mean, their enthusiasm to serve and then beyond that, you know, get to know other like-minded individuals who are our Tillman military scholars. A question way in the back. Come forward. We saw last night in the video profiling Michelle Obama's life that, in her work in the White House as First Lady, that she and Dr. Jill Biden are working with military families. Are you all in any partnerships with what they're doing? And if so, how has that interaction been? We are. We're part of um, the Joining Forces Coalition. Do they call it a coalition? Well, I don't, they don't call it no. a coalition. We're part of Joining, Joining Forces. Joining Forces, which is their initiative out of the White House. Um, and, you know, I, I think it's great. I was really happy that they chose that as one of their issues because it has helped to bring awareness. Yeah, we, one specific uh, benefit we found from the relationships from Joining Forces, we work with Inc. Magazine. Uh, on an entrepreneurship program for military veterans. We get to send uh, some of our scholars and help recruit other military spouses, military veterans to their annual conference, which is going to be in Phoenix yeah, in a month, month and Marie yeah. will be there to speak <laughs> as well. Um, and apply, uh, you know, the connectivity of the White House to the veteran space is really what they're able to do. Yeah. And it's been a big focus. I think the two biggest focuses for the First Lady have been Health, uh, and health, yeah, yeah ch child health and, and veterans. Yeah. No question about that. And certainly for Dr. Biden, I mean, she has, you know, one of her yeah, kids. Yeah, Beau Biden is, served yeah. and so. had a deployment overseas. Mm -hmm. I think we have. I'd just like to applaud you for coming up with a, a positive outcome of what had to be a very tragic event to go through. The uh, military wives that have lost their spouses in action. There's no training for what you had to go through. And, and there's no medals that they'll present to you. But you have faced it courageously and come up with a positive outcome. Thank you so much. Oh, thank, you. thank you. I agree. <laughs> Can anyone give me a time check? 
Okay, we're, we're going to take one more question and then um, have a little bit of time for Marie to stick around and then off to the airport. So anyone have a final question for us, for Marie? Julianne Dunn. <laughs> she only cried twice when reading the book. Nicolette cried six times. So um, I really wanted to talk about the, the development of the Tillman Foundation from something small that was really focused in Arizona. And now it's become such a huge national presence in such a short amount of time. I'd love to hear you talk a little bit more about what lessons you've learned and what you, advice you could give to a lot of our new classes in here would love, you know, are, are interested in starting in nonprofits. And I'm, anything you can share would probably be very yeah. helpful. You know, I think that we really did hit our stride when we focused our mission. Um, in the beginning, we were, we were local in Arizona and we were trying to have a larger impact, more of a national impact, but we were really doing leadership, service, and education, which is still pretty broad. Um, and once we focused into education and veterans specifically, it was much easier to figure out what relationships were the best partnerships for us and how to accomplish our goals. I was lucky to be in the middle of that storm. You were, you came that summer when yeah. we like made the decision, yeah. Is that they, the board said, we want to fund scholarships for veterans, what does that look like? And the GI Bill uh, had just been passed and was going to be implemented. And really a perfect storm and found their stride with what it is we do now. Yeah. And I think the other thing too for other people in the nonprofit space, it really is the partnership. Um, I think that we have found so much value in what are other organizations doing that can complement what we're doing and, and where can we find those strong links so that we don't have to have, you know, we, we are growing but still a relatively small organization. We don't have the resources or the infrastructure to support everything that we want to do. So making those connections with other organizations really amplifies yeah. the impact. Yeah, there's a lot of great organizations out there, and we, we find what we present as resources to our scholars really just builds loyalty in our scholars for the foundation. And I mean, if you look up American Corporate Partners, or we talked about Give an Hour earlier, which provides mental health, and mm -hmm. Student Veterans of America is a big partner of ours. So they're, they're out there, and, and we've been able to foster those relationships. Before we uh, go, I have a special uh, gift I'd like to present to the Clinton School. This is Marie's second visit. It's been a little over five years. And in the military tradition, for those of you who are aware, you have challenge coins. And as a friend and partner of the foundation, we want to present this challenge coin to the Clinton School. Thank you. And you know that he has those on his desk in the office. Yeah. Thank you. So again, thank you all for uh, obviously hearing from Marie. Uh, thank you. We'll end it here, and, and thanks. We'll be back in Arkansas for sure. For sure. Another five I'm years. I'm getting a promise from him <laughs> right now. Thank you.